Okay, we're taking a look at the famous game Terrible Swift Sword, The Three Days of Gettysburg. And uh, the reason why I, I want to do a video on this is because um, I couldn't find one. I was astounded that no one has done a video on this classic game. Now I'll tell you a little bit about the game, we'll look at the pieces, and uh, tell you a little bit about its history. Now, this game came out in 1976 it's by designer Richard Berg, who was very prolific in the 70s and still designing games today. It was a large monster game, monster in the sense that there's a lot of pieces to it. Nothing to do with Frankenstein and the Wolfman or anything like that. Monster game in our hobby usually means a large game with lots of pieces and large maps. Now, Terrible Swift Sword was not the first of the monster games. I think we have to give that um, award to perhaps La Bataille de la Mascova that came out the year before in 1975. But Terrible Swift Sword was certainly one of the large uh, Civil War games that, to come out first and um, it was a gem indeed. I mean, we all bought it back in 76 and it was a very talked about game and uh, it is also the father or grandfather of a whole series of games uh, called the Great Battles of the American Civil War and it spawned many many other titles sequel titles like Stonewall and the Shenandoah, uh, Cedar Mountain Wilson's Creek, Jackson at the Crossroads, the Battle of Corinth, Pea Ridge, Rio Grande Valverde, and many others like Bloody April, Shiloh, and Antietam. So uh, let's take a look at this old classic game. Now looking at the game today, it brings back a lot of memories for me. Uh, this is not my copy of the game. A friend of mine, Harry Martin, was gracious enough to lend me his copy so uh, for this video. and Because um, I haven't seen the game in oh, nearly 20 years. And this edition is uh, almost in pristine condition. It's been punched and sorted. And Harry assures me it took him about two or three hours just to sort the counters. And I can believe it. Because when I zoom in on the counters, you'll see what I mean. Anyway, what you get with the game is, of course, the Union Army down to the regimental battery level and the Confederate Army. Tons of informational markers. You can see they take a whole set of trays all by themselves. You get three maps, quite large, very large, and I'm going to lay out the game and show you that. And of course you get two sets of sorting trays with the cover sheet, terrible sword, and another cover sheet, uh, cover sheet there. You got, in those days, just one uh, rules booklet, not two. All your scenarios and your brigade combat effectiveness charts and stuff were inside. And looking at this manual today, uh, I just see how much the system has evolved. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that when I lay out the game. Let's take a look at this game laid out and see how big this game really is. Okay, now that's the maps laid out. There's three of them, and I'm going to zoom in on them so you get an idea of uh, what they look like. All right, now the... Um, now I put some plastics down on them. That's something we didn't have back in 1975-76. Uh, we were all students back then. I don't think we had the funds to afford them. Anyway, I've, I've put plastics down to keep the maps flat. Um, now even with that, you can see I'm hard pressed to get this game to fit on my table. You can see it overlapping a little bit there on the left and on the right. So it's a very um, awkward size. It's got sort of two maps that are wide there and a skinnier one here which I don't really care for. Uh, it was awkward back in 76 and it's certainly awkward now. Now we'll follow the, um, the map a little bit showing you what it was like. You had your Union turn record chart here and where you keep, um, oh pardon me, it's the casualty record where you show captured guns and artillery ammunition and of course the Confederate would have their equivalent over here and of course your terrain effects chart. Now the terrain modeling was pretty simple and uh, there are little problematic things with fitting the maps together. They don't fit, fit together really really well. I probably could have done a better job but you can see that there's a lot of huge areas with wide open terrain and the depiction of the ridge system at Gettysburg is, um, well, let's call it simple and maybe a little old-fashioned. I mean, you've got your Cemetery Hill here, and Cemetery Ridge. 
This is the angle, which is very weird. It's got the stone walls, but they're actually below the ridge. You have these sort of gentle slopes here, and uh, Pitzer's Run and Willoughby's Run over there. Rock Creek is over here, a bit wider. And there's your famous Culp's Hill. And this series of ridges here, I forgot the name, but um, I, I'm not saying it's wrong. Let's just say it's, it's simple. And you've got the sunken road here. The town depiction is pretty fair. And you've got the main pike out here, Chambersburg, at Ferson's Ridge. There's where the seminary would be. One thing I'm disappointed in this map is uh, that there's no farmhouses or anything uh, depicted. Uh, they've got a name for the seminary, but not even a, a little picture. And there's out the York Pike. But you get the idea that the game is simple. Or the, rather, the map is simple. So we were just love, in love with this thing back in 76 because, I mean, it was Gettysburg. And it, and it was huge. And you had every regiment and every battery. I mean, how cool is that? And your staging areas for when the Confederates come on. So that's what the map is like. Uh, it was okay in 76. It's certainly been surpassed now by some of Rick Barber's fine maps, like in Summer Storm, Joe Eust's map in the uh, Three Days of Gettysburg, which I now have. I'll do a video on that sometime. Anyway, um, that's a look at the map. Let's take a look at the pieces and uh, some of the things about the uh, combat system itself. Okay, looking at the pieces to this old classic, I was quite surprised at some of the things I found. I had forgotten a lot of things about this game. And what surprised me was the command structure used. For example, the Union has a core division, then regiment structure. So, for example, here we have the uh, third division of the Sixth Corps under uh, Newton, and just a collection of regiments under his command. There was no Union brigade structure while the Confederates did have a brigade structure. So, for example, going down, you'd have Ewell's Corps, Corps Commander, Division Leader Johnson, and there'd be numerous brigades attached to him. In this case, Walker's Brigade, the Stonewall Brigade, with its associated regiments. So that was quite a surprise, seeing the Union without a brigade structure. And that meant that the sorting was kind of nightmarish for the game. For example, you'd have uh, a Union division with just all its assorted regiments. At least the Union, uh, the Confederates had a brigade structure, which is uh, a little bit more logical. Now, no doubt, this was one of the first of the big Civil War games, and perhaps counter mix was a, um, a factor in the production of the game. I don't know, and I'm not taking a backhanded slap at the design. Just interesting to see how things were done back in '76 compared to the way they are done now. Let's make a comment on the uh, the counters themselves. This one really surprised me too because I'd totally forgotten about it. That in this early edition of the uh, rules that became the standard rules, the regiments do not have morale numbers on them. And that really freaked me out because I remembered kind of remembering how did the morale work in those days? Well, the morale worked by the size of the unit. And that's where there was an inherent problem in the game. But let's uh, look at what is actually stated on the counters. Well, in this example, we've got the 2nd Virginia of the Stonewall Brigade. It's armed with rifles because of the R, and its strength size is 2. And there you have the little uh, silhouette of an infantryman firing. Uh, of course, the equivalent is the same for the Union. 72nd Pennsylvania of the 2nd Brigade. 2nd Division, 2nd Corps, it's also rifle-armed and is size 2. So that's how uh, the named units worked. The brigades would have, uh, brigade leaders would have one star, their command range and their command value. And of course the Union only had divisions, so they had two stars, and the command range and their value, Corps and Division for Confederate here. Uh, the counters, of course, were gray uh, for a Confederate, which I really liked. And the black on gray worked not too bad. The black on the dark blue uh, worked. It's a little hard on the eyes by today's standards, and I can see that this was improved in later editions of the game. I'm going to show you that in, in a moment.
Now, I must point out that the original game did have these brigade combat effectiveness sheets. That was in the original game. And what happened as each regiment took hits, you mark them out on this little roster, and when the brigade reached a certain amount of casualties, the brigade itself would lose effectiveness. Now, as I mentioned, the Union didn't have a brigade structure, so I'm kind of wondering how that worked. Well, what happened was, as the series evolved, by the time of, I don't know if it was Stonewall or Bloody April, I'm just going to take a counter here from uh, the game Cedar Mountain to show you what changed. And it, it's an important change. And as you can see, the change was the addition of these little wee small number, which indicated the morale of the unit. So in the original Terrible Swift Sword, and this was the great flaw, the morale of the unit was directly related to its size. Thus, for example, the 64th New York being R4 and the 2nd Virginia being an R2, the morale of the 64th New York was twice as good as this unit's morale. And that's where the problem was. Because you could have large green regiments, like a fresh Vermont regiment that was close to 700 men, would have a much higher morale than, let's say, the veteran elite Stonewall Brigade regiments, which might be small in physical size, but certainly were uh, better regiments than these large green Vermont regiments. And that was addressed when they later added the morale numbers to the series. Uh, so that was fixed very early on in the series. Um, you have to remember this was 76, this was a new undertaking, a large game, and we have to be a bit more forgiving for the system. But um, I'll show you the, uh, the new rules, and uh, we'll see how the system evolved. Okay, so the original terrible Swift Sword rules, which was one manual, eventually kind of morphed into the standard rules for the Great Battles of the American Civil War. And uh, as I showed you in the, earlier in the video, there were such titles as Wilson's Creek, Pea Ridge, and uh, Drive on Washington. And what they did was they standardized the rules. And as you can see, you can see the morale numbers now on each of the counters. They also gave a brigade structure to the Union. For example, here's some units in uh, Cedar Mountain. And by that time, the Union now had a division and brigade structure which made the games much, much better. They also had the um, Brigade Combat Effectiveness charts, and um, they added some other little tweaks, too, uh, of which I'll try to show you one. Okay, as, as I had mentioned before, uh, size of the unit was directly related to morale, but it also affected the fire table, and this is where another failing of the game came through, but uh, again, they corrected it in later editions. What it meant was, uh, of course, this fellow being a four and this fellow being a two, he had twice as many men, therefore um, he could take twice as many casualties. Okay, uh, not a problem there. That's rather historically accurate. But what the problem was, was in the fire tables. And they eventually uh, fixed that up. So, for example, the four unit there, normally with all things being equal, he'd be firing on the four to six table. All right, not a problem there. In the good old R2, he'd be firing on the 1 to 3 table. Again, not inherently a problem. But where the problem occurred in the game was, since these units were small, and once they got hit, so in other words, if he, this guy took one hit, he'd already be at 50% casualties. Well, if this guy took a hit, he'd only be at 25% casualties. Well, uh, is that correct? Well, yeah, maybe, but... What happened, the net effect, was that these small units were very, very fragile. And veteran elite units, like the Stonewall Brigade, that had or fewer in numbers, didn't last very long in the game. They were shot to pieces and retired. And that kind of, um, well, that was a bit of a bummer. So what they did was, and I don't know which edition it was, it might have been Bloody April, they um, added a fire density modifier. So if you had a stack of let's say a big stack of an R4 and a C3 and they were stacked very high, it had a, um, 
an unfavorable modifier when you fired against it. It was easier to hit and take more casualties. On the contrary, if the unit was small, like the Stonewall Brigades, regiments, there would be a favorable modifier in its defense, a little bit harder to hit. It was a very subtle rule, small rule, but it helped uh, address that balance, and I think it made it into a better simulation. Okay, just looking at the number of uh, informational markers you've got on this game uh, gives you an idea of just how long it would take to play and how many pieces are involved. Now, I've never counted them, but there's hundreds and hundreds of pieces in this game. And uh, as units took hits, you'd put these little wee four, three, or two, one markers on them. Uh, there were markers to show breastworks, or the making of breastworks. There were special markers to show artillery ammunition. So for its time, this was a, a pretty complicated game. It seems rather simple today when I look at it, because we've come so far in the game. Now, let's be truthful about this game in speaking of it. And I speak of this game with great affection. But I'm not going to say that in 1976 we were playing this thing every weekend and enjoying it. I mean, I have to be truthful. I've never completed a game of Terrible Sith Sword. And to be brutally honest, I don't know anybody who has completed one either. Now back in 76, I remember a bunch of us got together at Carleton University and played a long weekend. I think we played all day Friday, all day Saturday, and most of Sunday. And we only got to the July 2nd turn uh, 4 p.m. in the afternoon, I think it was, or something like that. So we never had time to actually finish this game. And though we may wax nostalgic on this uh, great game, um, let's face it, I don't think too many of us uh, completed entire games of it. Uh, Terrible of Sword is, is more of an experience than a game. I mean, we all remember it with affection. Um, we had a lot of fun with it. Would I play it today? No, I don't think so. It's been eclipsed by much better titles. And even there, these monster games, like Three Days of Gettysburg, which is Richard Berg's own remake of his magnum opus, and a fine game it is. But again, I've never completed a game of Three Days of Gettysburg either, and I don't know anybody who has. These are large, huge studies. I'm almost loath to call them games. They're games in the sense that we roll dice and move counters, but... Really, do we finish them? I don't know. Now, mind you, there are scenarios. You can play some fine scenarios in Terrible Sith Sword. First day, or second day, or maybe a Culp's Hill scenario. Most of the newer games have scenarios. So, um, no illusions about that. You, you can play scenarios with these games. But, that's all I have to say about Terrible Sith Sword. Uh, it was a classic in its day. I, rem I remember it with great affection. And... I'm grateful to Richard, Richard for giving us this game back in 76. Uh, I will always have fond memories of it. Um, like I said, I borrowed this copy. I don't even own the game anymore. But uh, I'll always remember it with great affection. So uh, that's the summary for Terrible Sword, designed by Richard Berg in 1976. Thank you for watching.